So, uh, as Dave said, I, um, I was heavily involved in one of the instruments for James Webb. In fact, I was the project manager for the mid infrared instrument. I'm a chartered engineer. I spent 30 years in the space industry. And the last 10 of those years were on JWST. I retired eight years ago, and that was a year after we delivered the flight instrument to NASA, and the damn thing is still not launched. Um, but anyway, that's another story. This will be mainly pictures, I'm sure you'll be relieved to hear. There is a bit of text. There are a few numbers, because this is a, a scientific engineering project, we've got to have some numbers. I just want to say, if anybody, if you've not yet discovered, you could go to the NASA ESA or there's a UK Space Agency website with loads of information, pictures and so on about James Webb. Of course, what they can't give you are the, uh, the inside stories. So I want to start with the historical context for James Webb. And the orbital space age began 4th of October 1957. I was just a lad then, I'm that old. And that's when Sputnik 1 was launched, the first artificial Earth satellite and a truly momentous event in world history. Six days from now will mark 60 years since the first human went into space, as somebody's already mentioned. And the Hubble Space Telescope went up in April 1990. And it's true to say that Hubble completely revolutionized our view of the universe. In fact, some people say of the over 400 years since the invention of the telescope, uh, there are two phases before Hubble and Hubble. And, and Hubble just changed everything. Now, if all goes to plan, JWST should be launched later this year. That should be an event for astronomy that is likely to be even more momentous and revolutionary if it all goes to plan. So this talk to provide an overview of how it came to be, why it looks the way it does, and a preview of what might come after it's launched. I suspect I might go on for quite a bit over an hour, so if you've had enough, somebody shout at me to stop. I can stop anywhere, really. But first, who was James Webb? So we need to go back to 1961. As I said, um, Sputnik was launched in 57. That really led to the founding of NASA. But NASA was a, a collection of almost individual fiefdoms, little research agencies scattered across the United States. It had got very modest stature in, in federal circles in government. And there was a view that what they called the Buck Rogers nonsense, it would all calm down once they put an American into space. And basically, NASA was looking at trying to orbit a few satellites and they got this project called Mercury to put a man in space, but there was no thinking of the moon or anything beyond Mercury. Mercury was almost a, a, a knee-jerk reaction. But John Kennedy became president in January 1961. And American politics as such at the heads of the main agencies are political appointments. So it's a new, a, a new administration, and actually 17 people, very well qualified, turned down the request to be the head of NASA. Not least because the, the, the guy who led the Spain Council was Lyndon B. Johnson, the vice president, or LBJ, who was an extremely nasty piece of work. Of Those of you of more mature years may well remember some of the things about him. And eventually he persuaded James Webb. He was a 55 year old lawyer, an ex undersecretary of state. So he knew how government worked and he was a smart cookie. And he was persuaded by Kennedy to become the second NASA administrator. And many would argue the greatest in NASA's 63 year history. So Webb became the NASA chief. Now in government speak, he's called the administrator I think a lot of the Brits think the administrator is the guy that does the filing, but in, a, in government speak, the administrator is the head on show, the boss, the chief, whatever you want to call it. February 1961, he's appointed, only the second chief of this, this small agency. So here's Kennedy on the left, and James Webb, although he was always known as Jim Webb, um, uh, around the time he was appointed. And 
Two months after James Webb was appointed the head of NASA, this happened. Yuri Gagarin got launched, the first man in space, did an orbit of the Earth, and that was pretty traumatic. Now, to cut a long story short, in essence, Gagarin's flight led to Apollo. And there's a widely held myth that the German rocket scientist Werner von Braun was the man who led the Apollo program to the moon. And actually, completely wrong. More than anyone else, it was Jim Webb, who was the man that ensured that America eventually won the space race when Apollo 11 landed on the moon in 1969. And so three months after becoming uh, the head, James Webb found himself in charge of what became the largest, costliest, and most ambitious engineering project in human history, i.e. Apollo. And Webb steered the expansion of NASA from this minor collection of research labs, each one thinking it was a law unto itself. And he turned this into one of the grandest enterprises the world has ever seen with a phenomenal PR system. And of course it's become a legend and the legacy was uh, really down to him. But much more importantly, in many ways than Apollo, um, was what James Webb did for space science. Because the two things he did, he basically kicked ass, as the Americans would say, to make NASA a cohesive organization. He stopped the individual agencies playing their own politics, because he dealt with the politics. So he was the man who uh, interfaced with government, not these little, what were the time, little research uh, groups. But he wasn't just focused on the moon. He thought space science in parallel was really important. And a particular note, in the early days, he had saved the Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL, from having its funds cut by Congress, because basically they kept failing. JPL, without going into too much history, the name Jet Propulsion Lab was to avoid people realizing it was a rocket research establishment. And their way of working is very much like SpaceX at the moment. You fail fast, you fail often. So you build something, you test it, it breaks, you fix it, you test another one. And if you do that, it's a brilliant way to develop hardware, especially complicated hardware like rockets. And if you're a billionaire like Musk, of course you can afford to do it. And a lot of people are rubbishing him for all these failures. But actually, if you can afford it, it's the best way to develop rather than endless committees and reviews and eventually building some hardware after many years. But Webb saved Jet Propulsion Lab. He also clashed with the Goddard Space Flight Center director. And Goddard were one of the early agencies trying to put satellites together. And they thought they got, you know, they shouldn't have a headquarters looking after them. And there were some pretty bitter clashes. But he also supported the scientific work at Goddard and took a very early interest in what eventually became Hubble. So it's not surprising the project to follow Hubble is named the James Webb Space Telescope. And what I usually say is um, most, in fact, all telescopes and observatories are named after scientists or astronomers. This is very unusual to name something after a bureaucrat. If you were cynical, you might think NASA felt that um, it would make that project harder to cancel because the politicians wouldn't want to cancel something that was the only one that bore the name of one of their kind. But that would be cynical, of course. So a bit of background. The origins were in the mid 1990s and the next generation space telescope after Hubble was being formulated. You, well, the astronomers here will know if you look far into space, you're also looking far back in time. And what they wanted to do was to look back to the very first stars and galaxies that lit up after the so-called Big Bang, which Hubble cannot do. And this new space telescope was the top priority of the, uh, one of the major uh, it's decad decadal reports that comes out in America. And in fact, that, was, was, uh, that has been restated a number of times. Again, not very well known, the UK has a key role the UK led a multinational group that provides one of the four instruments on James Webb. And the lead scientist, or what is known as the principal investigator, is based at the Royal Observatory Edinburgh. And I was the project manager for this instrument. 
uh, as I said before, for the 10 years leading up to its delivery in 2012. I was based at what is now called Airbus and Stevenage, but it's gone through all sorts of names. It was a wonderful job because effectively a small group of us were hired out to the scientists and astronomers, and we operated completely independently from the big company to manage this European consortium to design, build, and test uh, MIRI, the mid infrared instrument. So here's a short video. Uh, word of warning, sometimes this thing locks up afterwards, so we'll have to sort that out. Um, it's only a few minutes long. This video, as far as I'm aware, is no longer available off the NASA website. It's got the wrong launch date, um, uh, but I think it's one of the best videos to sort of give you a, 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 an overview of what's going on. Um, it was mainly done for Americans, and of course they don't realise that the rest of the world doesn't work in degrees Fahrenheit. So you'll see a temperature quoted as minus 700 degrees F, which I think is completely meaningless to most Americans anyway, it's so, so low, but, but that's just one thing. So I'll let this play, there's a bit of stirring music, uh, and I'll say very few words over it. Okay, uh, can you still hear me, Dave? Certainly can, yep. Okay, um, so the video come over okay? Yeah, it did, didn't jump at all. Okay, so uh, we can't go on without talking about Hubble, of course. But I've put this picture in because one thing about Hubble is it looks like a telescope. You know, it's a tube, it's got a lid at one end, and at the right hand side, you've got this 2.4 meter diameter, big block of glass, which is basically the primary mirror. And all astronomers will know that looks pretty well like a telescope. And as I said, Hubble was absolutely revolutionary, but it has its limits. So here are the key points. If you don't remember anything else, these are the key points about James Webb. Um, 
NASA trying to call it just web, which I think is a bit crackers because everyone's going to get confused with the World Wide Web, I'm sure. But web or JWST uh, is the successor to Hubble. It's a joint mesh, uh, mission with the Eastern Canadian Space Agencies. Very crudely in the early days, NASA provided something like 80% of the funding, ESA 15% and Canada 5%. And on those uh, ratios, the observing time given to the astronomers who are involved in building this thing, they, they get observing time in those proportions. Since then, the NASA cost has gone up enormously. We've said it's named after Jim Webb, who was so important for space science. But the observatory is optimized for infrared observations. And for the techies, we're talking 0 0.6 to 28 microns. And you need to be there to study the origin and evolution of galaxies and stars and look at planetary systems. The primary mirror is six and a half meters across and it has to fold to fit into the European Ariane 5 rocket that will launch it. The launch vehicle is part of the European contribution. And the telescope and most of the instruments operate at what we call cryogenic temperatures or minus 233 degrees Celsius which is 40 degrees K, K, K for Kelvin. Um, the absolute zero is minus 273.16, I think, degrees C, uh, which is zero Kelvin. Um, so 40 Kelvin is minus 233 C, which is pretty cold. I think the coldest place on earth is about, ever recorded, is about minus 88 C to give you a figure. And you've got to be that cold to get the infrared performance to deliver the science. But one of the other things about Webb is the lead scientist at NASA is a Nobel Prize winner. He is the only NASA Nobel laureate. And John Mather is the, the chap on the right. Uh, and he got the Nobel Prize in physics in 2006, uh, along with the other guy there. Um, uh, and that was for their work on COBE, the cosmic microwave background, uh, which was the spacecraft that basically confirmed the cosmic microwave background or the afterglow of the Big Bang. And that was probably the final nail in the coffin of the steady state universe theorists. Uh, but John Mather is, really, is a real gentleman, a really nice guy, uh, but he is the lead scientist and Nobel laureate. And there are four key science goals for James Webb. Uh, first light and reionization, assembly of galaxies, birth of stars and protoplanetary systems and planetary systems and the origin of life. I'm going to say a few words about each of these, but I'll, I'll skip through most of those pretty quickly. First light and reionization. What they're trying to get to are what they call the first luminous sources, the first stars and galaxies to form. And that determines the ionization history of the early universe. Now, after the Big Bang, so-called, um, or the beginning, and until the universe had cooled sufficiently, everything was ionized, which meant that protons and electrons were not joined together in atoms. They were flying around in what we call this ionized state. And until the universe was cold enough uh, for them to actually be able to combine to make mainly hydrogen, the universe was opaque. But when that happened, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, uh, that's when the universe became transparent and that's when the cosmic microwave background, which is the afterglow of the Big Bang, which is the remaining uh, temperature we see in the universe, that's when that started. And first light is when the very first galaxies or superstar clusters formed after that um, uh, point where the, the cosmic microwave background could travel. But for a long period of time, the universe was dark and there were no stars. And those first stars were mainly hydrogen. They were big, they burned incredibly hot and fast, and they basically reionized the um, atoms uh, in the neighborhood. And in poetic terms, first light marks the end of the cosmic dark ages with the arrival of the cosmic dawn. Uh, and in less poetic, poetic terms, these first light galaxies will actually have much lower metallicity than other objects and an absence of older stellar populations. So here's a picture a lot of you may have seen. 
Uh, this is diagrammatic to try and explain the entire history of the universe, which given the time, I'm not going to attempt to do all of it, but essentially uh, from Big Bang until now, it's about 13.7 or 13.8 billion years. Um, and on the left there, there's a thing called the afterglow light pattern. That's the cosmic microwave background. And you've got this dark age period until you get the first stars. Now, when this chart was first shown, they thought that was maybe about 400 million years after the um, Big Bang. We now think it could be even uh, less, probably maybe 100 million years. But that's one of the things that James Webb needs to go and go and look at. And then that shows the evolution of the universe, gradual expansion. And then a few billion years ago, this accelerated expansion that we call dark energy, because I'm going to clue what it's about. But the other things they want to look at about how galaxies assembled, um, why they so many different shapes, how do black holes get to be there and, and all the rest of it. Um, there's also births of stars and planets. And we know a lot goes on inside these huge cosmic dust clouds and infrared can penetrate the dust. Hubble can't, it's, it's got a little bit of near infrared. So here's the famous Pillars of Creation picture, I'm sure you all have seen. Uh, those dust clouds, which are a, a, a planetary uh, birthplace, uh, stellar birthplaces. And here's a picture in the infrared of the same thing. And of course, you start to see an awful lot more when you can peer through the dust. And James Webb is going to take that to a completely new level. Um, also, how do planets form and the origin of life? I'm not going to dwell on this one, um, but we have to put in the little green men somewhere. Um, but let's not dwell on that too long. So why does it look like, like it does? And for all engineering projects, it's the science goals, the requirements that drive the design. And I'm gonna spend a few minutes on this because there's some very key features that explain why it looks like it does. The astronomers will know that size matters for a telescope. You know, the bigger, the better. And initially they wanted an eight meter diameter primary mirror. Now that is bigger than any rocket fairing existing or even planned. So you've got to have a foldable primary mirror of some sort to be able to get that in. And that's a huge challenge. The goal is also to look back further in space and time than Hubble. But you can't do that in visible light because the universe has expanded, continued to expand since the Big Bang. It's the fabric of space time, as people say, that has stretched the, the, the basic stuff between matter. So any light, any radiation traveling through space over a long period of time, it's like drawing a, a wave on a rubber band. If you stretch the rubber band, the wavelength gets longer. Now, most stars, the peak energy is sort of around about visible light, uh, which is not a surprise that our eyes have evolved to make maximum use of the, 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 the peak wavelengths. Um, but if you want to look back at those very early stars, there's no point in looking uh, in visible light. You need to look in the infrared. And you must be in space because the Earth's atmosphere absorbs most infrared radiation. So a ground-based telescope just simply won't work at these wavelengths. So the fact they want to look back so far tells you it's got to be a space telescope and it's got to be an infrared one. And infrared radiation is essentially heat. So you don't want to detect your own instruments. Um, and the analogy used is it's like building an optical telescope out of fluorescent tubes. Um, you don't see any objects in the sky because all you see is the light coming from your telescope. So to make it work, you've got to operate around about this 40 Kelvin temperature. And in fact, Miri needs to operate even colder to get the science goals. So these are the things that say, uh, that, that drive the design. Now, another factor is the initial goal was for a lifetime of at least five years, target of 10. And actually what that tells you is you cannot be in low Earth orbit like Hubble. Hubble orbits about 550 kilometers above the Earth. It's, it's basically spitting distance away. Um, the problem is, if you're in low Earth orbit, you are exposed to the heat from the planet, uh, which is very hot compared to the temperature which an infrared observatory needs to operate. Now, you can, small observatories have been there, 
but they got to carry coolant to, to chill the instruments down and that constantly boils off and that limits the lifetime and it's very simple the amount of coolant you'd need something for something the size of James Webb and a 10 year lifetime you couldn't launch it it would be it would be just so so massive so therefore you've got to design this observatory to operate well away from the earth you've got to be able to shield it from the heat radiation of the sun earth and moon and ideally you can use the natural cold of deep space to get down to this 40 kelvin operating temperature so how do we achieve operation at 40 kelvin well there's a point in space well away from the earth where you can have a stable orbit with respect to the earth and be exposed to deep space which is a temperature of about three kelvin or minus 270 c that is the afterglow of the big bang and if you just stare at deep space you will get down to that kind of temperature if you've got no other heat flowing into you this is known as the second lagrange point or l2 it's about four times further from the earth and the moon in the direction away from the sun although they call it the lagrange point in reality this is a huge volume of space now you can passively cool the telescope and the instruments down to 40 kelvin and i say passively cool what i mean is you don't have to do anything if you just set this thing up and let it look at deep space you can get it down to this temperature so long as the spacecraft bus that's the the box that controls it that needs to be at basically room temperature which is about 300 kelvin um, so long as you isolate that bus from the telescope and instruments and you isolate the telescope and instruments from the direct radiation from the, the sun earth and moon and to do that that's where the sun shield comes in and in fact it's got to be a five layer called a parasol it is literally the size of a tennis court a board astronomer on a test uh, campaign worked out it was a, a sun protection factor actually about 1.2 million I know the video said a million, but I think 1.2 is more like it. So that, that's the kind of shield you're talking about. And of course, it's also going to fold up to fit inside the rocket for launch. So to realize the design was to turn all these things into reality. It was soon apparent that this eight meter diameter primary mirror was just going to be too big and expensive even for NASA. Um, it, it was just not going to work. They realized though, if we reduce the primary mirror diameter down to about six and a half meters, there wasn't too much compromise on the science goals. However, you still need a folding and essentially that means a segmented mirror design. And just to clarify, uh, there are 18 hexagonal mirror segments in the, in the primary mirror. They form a single large mirror with one focus. There's not 18 separate images come out of it. They, all these segments are uh, motored together to form a single curved uh, mirror. But the observatory required 10 simultaneous major technology development programs to succeed. Now that is a phenomenal um, uh, project to attempt. You, if you do one major development program on a project, that, that is pretty risky. To do 10 is audacious. And of those 10, the mirrors, so we're talking about lightweighted uh, beryllium uh, hexagons and all the motors and things to control them, the sun shield and the instruments were the most significant of those. But there are some incredible developments. And the other thing is the observatory is not going to be serviceable in operation like Hubble, simply because, well, A, there's not a space shuttle, but B, the space shuttle can't go beyond low Earth orbit anyway. And it is not going to look like any other space telescope flown before. There is not going to be a tube at this size. And one of the other factors for the, those of you well into the astronomy is you've got to be so careful with stray light control, but that's, a, that's another story. And in fact, it was pretty obvious you need to make this project international to spread the cost and also get the best expertise available because um, there's a pretty good claim that Europe invented infrared space astronomy. Uh, we were there first. So let's take a quick look at the overall uh, approach to James Webb. There's really three elements to it. There's the launch segment, which is the Ariane 5 rocket, the observatory or the spacecraft, uh, or what we just call, when we say James Webb, we tend to mean 
just the observatory, um, which has got a number of different bits. And then there's the ground segment because all that comes back from James Webb is data. And that is, it's going to be operated from the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is at Baltimore, which is not far from Goddard. Um, uh, if, for those, any of you know it, the STS, it's called STSCI, Space Telescope Science Institute. It's just over the road from the Johns Hopkins uh, University. It's not a very impressive looking building, um, but that's where Hubble is controlled from, through the Deep Space Network, uh, and in fact, they, they tie in with the European network and all sorts of people. So here's an artist's impression of the observatory. And of course, as we said, looks nothing like your ordinary telescope. Let me try and explain very quickly a few of the key elements. So on the left, we've got um, the actual telescope, which is a main six and a half uh, meter diameter primary mirror made of 18 hexagons. Uh, you've got a secondary mirror, hanging out on those struts. And then the lights bounced off there through the, the, the black bit in the middle of the main mirror, uh, where you've got the tertiary mirror, and then you've got some pick-off mirrors and steering mirrors. Um, the instruments are mounted behind the mirror. You've got the five-layer sun shield, and on the right-hand side, looking at the back of it, there's a thing called the back plane, this big structure that holds the mirrors. And if you notice on the back of each mirror, there's a sort of triangular thing there are actually motors on there to give seven degrees of freedom to each of the hexagon segments. The bit with a purple roof, uh, th these colours are just artistic, of course. Um, the thing called ISIM is the Integrated Science Instrument Module. And the spacecraft bus is the box at the bottom. Basically, that provides the power, the pointing, the control, the telemetry, uh, all, all those functions. And then the red tube linking them uh, is actually a telescoping tube because you've got to minimize the heat flow from the bus into the telescope and instruments in order to, to keep it controlled. So actually the telescope telescopes off the bus after launch, uh, just to add another degree of complexity. And it's big, I don't expect you to read all this. So we're talking stowed, it's nearly 11 meters tall. 21 meters by nearly 15 meters as the sun shield fully deployed. Uh, we're talking about a, a thing that's nearly six and a half tons at launch. It's a, a pretty big beast. Here's another way to look at it. This is a, a mock-up that NASA built in the very early days, a full-size mock-up. This is at the Goddard Space Flight Center uh, with some of the staff there to give you some idea of the real size of this beast. And another way to look at it is the primary mirror size. So on the left there, you've got the 1.8 meter tall standard man, the Hubble primary mirror at 2.4 meters, which is a big block of glass. Hubble was not the biggest space telescope, the European Herschel telescope, that was a far infrared design is now decommissioned, uh, is there. And then you compare that with the six and a half meters of James Webb. Another way um, of, of looking at how they, they observe is on the electromagnetic spectrum. I think a lot of you will know um, gamma rays, radio, microwave, radar, infrared, visible light, they're all just different wavelengths of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum, of which visible light is a, a thin sliver. Um, for those like numbers, it's, it's basically 0.4 to 0.7 microns is the wavelength of visible light. And Hubble is basically visible light and a tiny bit into the near infrared. James Webb is basically going from uh, the near infrared out well through the infrared into the mid infrared, about 30 microns. And the Spitzer telescope, which was only a 0.85 meter primary mirror, but was regarded in some ways as a, a pull through for James Webb. Uh, Spitzer did some amazing discoveries, but that worked at slightly longer wavelengths. And for the, the real astronomers, technically it's a three mirror and a stigmat, and a stigmatic optical design. In other words, it's got three curved main mirrors. It provides a wide field of view. And of course, you, with that design, you basically get rid of spherical aberration, coma, and astigmatism. Uh, it's an F20, 
with an effective focal length of 131.4 meters. So think, you know, you've seen the 100 meters being run, we'll go nearly third again, that's the focal length. What would you give for a telescope like that? Uh, give you some idea, the optical resolution at two microns, so you're into the near infrared, is, is about 0.1 arc seconds. What that means is you could resolve a, a, a penny, you know, a 1p coin, you could work out that was a coin at a distance of about 40 kilometers, 25 miles. And it's claimed that thermally, you could pick up a B at the distance of the moon um, uh, in terms of the thermal performance. But essentially it's a Cassegrain telescope uh, with some very, very smart optics. So in summary, James Webb is so scientifically powerful and able to address the key outstanding questions that it will transform astrophysics and cosmology, a very bold claim, but that is what people believe. And I said, it is technically audacious. There are over 200 release and deployment mechanisms, and there are over 300 single point failures. A single point failure is things spacecraft people try and avoid, because you always put a redundant system, redundant systems in everywhere on spacecraft in case something goes wrong. But there are certain things that cannot be redundant. Um, if you want to separate something, you can't have a backup hold down point because you still got to release that. And 300 is a phenomenal number. Most of those are to do with the, the sun shield. But there are 22 um, major deployment activities to uh, get this thing out and, and ready to, to, to run. If I don't run out of time, I'll show you a few minute animation at the end and explain that in a bit more detail. And it doesn't come cheap, of course. By now, the lifetime cost, i.e. from the very beginning to decommissioning, is over $10 billion to NASA. There's over half a billion euros that come from ESA, there's also a number of significant independent European countries have made their own contributions, including the UK Space Agency, and there's the Canadian national contributions. We're talking probably getting on for $12 billion, but I point out that is still significantly less than $1 per light year of looking back in space and time. Uh, and if you think about it that way, it may not seem so bad, but NASA lost control of the cost completely. And that's prejudiced other jobs. Now, at the moment, the project is aiming for a Halloween launch date uh, this year. The observatory has completed the final round of testing, which is simulating the launch environment, and final checks and preparation for shipping from California are underway. Now, anybody who knows anything about rockets and, and, and the space business knows you take launch dates with a pinch of salt, but we may actually get a launch uh, uh, this year. So, am I still okay to keep going, Dave? Yeah, no worries, John. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, now it's mainly pictures. So, I thought I'd show you a few of the bits um, that have caused grief or, or of great interest. And the sun shield is, is a really key element that lets this passive cooling work. Um, and it, it's incredibly complicated. They actually lay on a planet, a, a pallet for launch, and you have to fold these five layers in separately, and then they're going to be covered with membranes to protect them. So just handling this stuff, I mean, these are, it's a bit like a uh, combination of cling film and baking foil. Um, each layer is incredibly thin uh, and very difficult to handle. And the size of it in Earth gravity makes it very difficult to simulate um, reality. Here's a, here's a couple of pictures of the early deployment testing. And the big picture, the thing in the middle is actually there's two men there. So some people think it, it looks like a bit of equipment, but give you some idea of scale of that's just one side of the uh, development, the, the, the mechanism to pull it out. Here's the full five layer flight sun shield again with people to give you uh, a, a sense of scale. Um, and as the man said, don't worry in the zero gravity of space, it will work perfectly. Fingers crossed. Here's the integrated science instrument module or ISIM as we call it. 
with the four instruments in there. They don't look very impressive. They're all wrapped in baking foil, basically these are thermal blankets to, to keep the temperature um, controlled inside. And you can see the technicians working with full bunny suits on because cleanliness uh, is absolutely paramount. You know, a speck of dust, if it gets in the wrong place, you might think you've just spotted a new planet, but uh, cleanliness is, is um, uh, paramount. And it may not look, look a great deal, but the black uh, bars are actually carbon fiber. It's a, a, stress, a, tr a truss structure um, and you've got to be incredibly uh, thermally um, uh, constant. And, and that itself was a fairly major development, just getting the structural to work. Um, instruments aren't very interesting. Most people don't even know they're there because everybody thinks about the telescope, but the telescope is only there to deliver the light into the instruments. And this is the mid infrared instrument. To give you an idea, that's about a meter cube. It's got black struts you can see that they're carbon fiber struts because the mirror has to be cooled cold on the other instruments because it's a different wavelength and it's basically bits of aluminium it doesn't look very impressive on the outside but miri was led by the uk 32 scientific institutes in 10 european countries each funded its own contribution outside the ESA. the uk contribution about 25 million pounds it's in a partnership with nasa's jet propulsion lab it's a 50 50 instrument and we have to interface and deliver to NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center through ESA. And it was led by Professor Gillian Wright, or it is led by Professor Gillian Wright, MBE, from the Royal Observatory at Edinburgh. The project management, the system engineering lead, and the project assurance was done by Airbus Defence and Space at Stevenage, which is where I was. We were the last instrument to be kicked off. There's another story in that. Uh, with the most complicated organization than any of the other instruments, but we were the first one to be delivered for launch. Uh, and that was a long time ago now. So here's Gillian Wright for, for the ladies present, um, a phenomenal astronomer in her own right. And one of those rare things, uh, a scientist astronomer who is also politically very, very astute. Uh, and, and knows how to, if you like, work the system and get things done. Very, very smart. That is actually the, the, uh, the big mock-up uh, I showed you um, in one of those earlier pictures. Uh, this was actually in Dublin. We have meetings all over the place. And if it's a NASA meeting, you get about 500 people there. Um, and that thing went, around a, went on a tour of Europe. Uh, it's a 50-50 partnership with the, uh, between Europe and the Jet Propulsion Lab. Here's, the, here's JPL's gateway. Um, managed from the Goddard Space Flight Center. And this is a picture of Goddard, uh, the campus. It's pretty massive now. The big building in the middle is the big clean room where the Hubble Space Telescope was built and the James Webb instrument, or well, the telescope uh, and the instruments were all, all put together in there. Um, I spent an awful lot of time out there at, at, at JPL. Uh, I'm not going to go through this to save time. That is actually some of the Astrium team um, with the functional block diagram that explains Miri. I've got a copy of that if anybody's ever interested. It'll take you about three days to work through all the information on there. Um, that is the flight model on its delivery frame wrapped in its thermal blanket. So it just looks like a oven ready Turkey. There are the 10 European country flags and of course the United States joint with JPL. And there are an awful lot of tough working meetings. A lot of, you can imagine lots of international arguments and um, uh, all sorts of problems to be overcome both technically and politically. Just to show you just how, how grim some of these meetings were. I'll just show you one of the, the pictures, one of the tougher ones. And there's the PI on delivery day. Uh, she wasn't always smiling, let me add. And we shipped out the flight instrument, having tested it at Rutherford Appleton Labs, uh, got it cleared through ESA and NASA to accept it. And it flew out on May the 29th, 2012, nearly nine years ago. That is pretty scary. I think the warranty ran out a few years back, but it basically goes in a special container in the belly hold of a, a 747. 
Uh, here's some of the other big developments. The mirrors, uh, each hexagon uh, starts out as a huge block of beryllium, which is a very nasty material to machine because it's carcinogenic in powder form. There's uh, 85 grams of pure gold on the mirrors in total because gold is the best infrared uh, reflecting medium. And each of the mirror segments was um, machined and polished and tested and then taken cold and tested and repolished if necessary. And they, the, the cycling to get these mirrors built uh, was, was absolutely incredible. And the sad thing is that the thing that delayed the whole observatory most was the bit that got the lowest risk, which was the, the spacecraft bus, but that's another story. And this is the Goddard uh, Space Flight Center, big clean room. The, the grid system at the back are the HEPA filters to make sure the air is clean coming in. And this is the room where the Hubble Space Telescope was built. They actually, also the mock-up in there when they were uh, working out some of the servicing missions. And the thing covered in black in the middle, that giant frame, they are covers over the gold covered uh, primary mirror sections. And that's where they're putting this into its back frame um, and, and basically getting all sorted out for the primary mirror. And NASA love acronyms. So the telescope is known as the optical telescope um, uh, equipment. Um, uh, that is OTE. And you've got the instrument science, the, the sorry, the integrated science instrument module ISIM. When you bought those two together, NASA called it OTIS to combine OTE and ISIM. Uh, and it's, it's not an elevator and it's not somebody who sings songs. But here is the completed primary, secondary, tertiary mirrors at Goddard in that clean room. You see the men underneath that give you some idea uh, of the size of this thing. There's the secondary folded up. And again, picture of scale, that's a mirror to die for. Uh, and then the whole thing, the, the telescope and the instruments in the, in the launch configuration have to go through a whole series of testing. They're wrapped in um, a, 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 an environmental fabric cover there to transport it from one place to another. It's put on a huge vibration table and shaken to simulate launch. It then got taken down to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, where it spent many months being uh, checked out and very cold. Give you some idea, that chamber is the chamber that the Apollo lunar excursion, excursion modules were dropped in and tested out in. Um, and it's huge. You can see the people standing, that is the door. The chamber goes way up into the, into the top there. And on the left is a bit of a schematic of the whole chamber. And the pink thing is the primary mirror. So you, you've got to put the telescope in there with instruments on the back. It hangs off bungee cords, off that big sort of purple frame at the top. And there's a telescope, well, there's a, a, a light simulator up there that shines light down to simulate things. So you put that in that chamber, you close the door, you pump it down to vacuum, and then you chill it down with liquid nitrogen to minus 180C to give you, so you're well on the way to being at space temperatures, but you can, you can compensate for the difference. But the time it takes to cool all that material down is absolutely enormous. Um, and months and months of testing were done at, at Johnson. Um, and in the middle of which, the, one of the hurricanes hit and um, flooded all sorts of places out. Fortunately, James Webb survived, but the guys on the test team had quite a rough time. So here's the integrated observatory. Uh, now, uh, this is out in uh, the prime contractor in Los Angeles. Uh, there's the five layer sun shield deployed. You can just see a person on the right there, get the scale. And there's the stowed and folded telescope. Here's the sun shield folded up onto its pallets. And here are the pallets being closed up around um, the, the, the telescope. Now, it's going to be shipped from the I'm going to get from the final test site to the launch site. So if you look at the black words first, for those who may not be too familiar with the geography, Northrop Grumman are basically at Los Angeles and the West Coast. The launch site is the East Spaceport in Karoo, French Guiana, uh, just north of Brazil, a few degrees north of the equator. 
So a barge is going to transport James Webb down the West Coast, past Mexico, through the Panama Canal. I do hope NASA have added evergreen shipping to their risk register for this, this journey. Then through the Caribbean, or the Caribbean, as the Americans would say, down to Karoo to the launch site. Uh, and just for, for those interested in green, uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL, is basically Pasadena, which is north Los Angeles, a bit beyond Hollywood. Goddard Space Flight Center, GSFC, is just around the, on the Beltway around Washington, D.C. Space Telescope Science Institute, SCSCI, is at Baltimore, a few miles away. And the Johnson Space Center is down at, at Houston. So, but that sort of hope that, that explains a few things. Um, I, I discovered the other day, uh, I was in Karoo for a, a different sort of satellite launch about 30 years ago. And I, I took a picture of the, uh, the, the, the launch site. It was a, the original French center. Um, it now become the European spaceport. And that picture is interesting because does it show how awful cameras were in those days? So it might be down to the, uh, the person taking it, of course. Here's a more recent picture of the European launch site with the Ariane 5 rocket, the white thing uh, almost in the middle. Uh, and that is exactly where James Webb will be launched from on one of those things. Here's the bit about the Ariane 5 and schematics of James Webb stowed inside the, the, the fairing. Uh, I won't say too much on this, but we need to look a bit about where it's going. Now, this picture is very definitely not the scale. And what you've got there is that the sun in the middle, the, the white thing, you've got the earth and the moon, and L2 out um, on the, the opposite side to the sun from the earth. Uh, there are actually five of these Lagrange points and this is quite a difficult thing to get your head round. The easiest one is L1 because this is the point where you can imagine the gravity of the Earth and the Sun balance. Now, the, the Sun is you know, a thousand, a million times more massive than the Earth. Um, and you can imagine the gravity of the Sun is incredibly strong. It's holding the Earth in place. Um, so the L1 point will be a lot closer to the Earth and the Sun, but you can kind of see there's a point there where gravity might balance. It's not obvious why there's another point out the other side, or L3 or 4 and 5. They're, you've got to do the maths to understand it, but they, they are points where um, you, you, can, you can get a very useful uh, view of space from there. And there's quite a few spacecraft at L2 already and a lot more due to go there. So here's, a, here's an even more not to scale picture to try and explain. Um, I think the astronomers all know that uh, the further away you are from the, the sun, the slower the planets travel. And if you're further away from the earth, you ought to be traveling slower. But the weird thing about these at Lagrange points is by putting a spacecraft there, it will track around the sun at the same rate as the earth by only using a small amount of rocket fuel. You don't need to do much to keep it there. So it always stays in line with the sun and the earth, which means if you're trying to shield the radiation, you don't have to worry about the, the, having the earth and the moon at a different position in the sky from the sun. It also means communications are a lot more stable and simple. And effectively, that, that's why we're going to L2, because you can put the sun shield to block, block out the radiated heat, and you've got uh, deep space if you look on, on the other side. So to get from launch to operations, it's gonna take about six months. The first month is needed to get to L2. And in that time, the observatory basically unfolds from its stow configuration. This is an amazing bit of origami um, so that you, you, you can unfold it. As I said, there are 22 major events. There's over 180 deployments to fully unfold it. And there's one really critical period lasting 11 days. Now, all these Mars guys that go on about their seven minutes of terror, these, these guys are amateurs. We've got 11 days of terrifying slow motion. Is it gonna work? And you'll see that on the video in a bit. The very first thing you've got to do is to get the solar array out so you can get some power in. 
and then the communication dish. <clears throat> Basically, you've then got to pause for a bit because there'll be water vapor absorbed and other volatiles that will outgas. Uh, that you, once you're in deep space, all this stuff outgasses and, and you leave it behind. And then you've got this really critical 11 day period. And once you get to L2, the telescope and the instruments have to passively cool down to the operating temperature. You've got to focus uh, the, the, the telescope, you've got to calibrate the instruments, there's a whole load of work. Um, so although they'll desperately try and get something before six months, it's normally six months. So I'm going to show you, if you bear with me, um, this video, I think it's about four minutes or so. Um, you can get this and there's, there's different versions on, on the various websites as I mentioned. But I'll show you this picture first so you know what to look out for. So what this video will show you is in the middle, you've got a picture of James Webb as it unfolds. At the top, it'll give you the mission elapsed time from days to seconds. And they will jump in you know, quite significant chunks at different times. It's not, a, it's not a linear thing. You don't have to watch this for a, a month. And then at the bottom, it tells you an event that's going on. Now, in this case, this is the point it, it got further from the Earth and Apollo 13. It's a bit irrelevant, really, but what you'll see is the picture of the Earth. The, the, the line coming along the bottom is the, uh, the path of James Webb, and you've got the moon there for comparison. So these are the things that, that will happen, um, and I'll, I'll say a few things as we go. If it's going to go. Oh. Ah. So here's the top stage of area five, just a You don't go to the straight out. So this is the opportunity can't hear your voice, John, because the music's taking precedence. Okay, I'll keep quiet.
So, uh, I think the word audacious when used about this project is, is completely fitting. It's, it's going to be a question of an awful lot of people with twitchy bums for 11 days while uh, the bulk of that's going on. So, let me try and wrap up with uh, some words to put this in perspective. So, the web will be the premier observatory for the next decade. It will serve thousands of astronomers worldwide and it will be complementary to the new generation of massive ground-based optical and radio telescopes. And already the, the first call for um, uh, observations, there have been in 1,100 proposals and, and astronomers worldwide, just they can't wait to get their hands on this. And the potential for new discoveries is absolutely enormous. Um, and to give you some idea, it's generally been the case that if a new telescope observatory, whatever, comes along with an order of magnitude improvement, a factor of 10, we'll call an order of magnitude. So if you've got a 10 times bigger mirror or an instrument can operate 10 times faster or 10 times more sensitive, generally you make striking new discoveries and it's the stuff of Nobel Prizes. Now, just to take MIRI, for example, one of the features on MIRI is 10, sorry, is 100,000 times better than anything that's ever been done before or is planned. It's five orders of magnitude. And one order of magnitude produces new discoveries. The other instruments have all got some amazing uh, capabilities. So the discovery space is enormous. But of course, astronomers are acutely aware of all the open questions and problems. So nothing new here, dark matter, dark energy, Where's the better model of gravity combining general relativity and quantum mechanics? Jim Al-Khalili was saying last time. Where did all the antimatter go? What's the nature of time? I mean, these things are wide open. There's so much we don't know. And uh, the, 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 the new generation coming along may give us a lead on these. And finding answers is what science is about. So we're on the threshold of finding some big ones. And this is a really exciting time to be an astronomer, a cosmologist, a scientist or an engineer or anybody helping um, build uh, and develop and test and launch the, these things. So it's a fantastic time. It's a great time to encourage uh, children, uh, young people to get involved because it's not a closed book. There's so much to be to be found out and there is so much going to be happening. But we must always remember, famous quote, science never gives up searching for truth since science never claims to have achieved it. Thank you. I'm sorry I've gone on for so long. Uh, I hope people are still there. Any questions? Fantastic, John. No, we're still here, I believe. Yep, people are still here. Yep, definitely. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Um, I was reading something, was it a couple of weeks ago, talking about security on um, the Webb Space Telescope as it's been shipped out and whether it could be hijacked or not. Have you seen any information on that? I think we're going to keep all of that pretty quiet. Um, it's it's a, a huge risk. <laughs> um, the, the thought of anything going wrong at any point is, is just horrific, but um yeah i am sure there's a lot of people paying great attention to that yeah you have to watch out for these pirate types out there don't you that's for sure as well yeah hey roger no comment <laughs> why are you keep <laughs> picking on me it's pete's well, you got any questions for john <laughs> i ask a question please yeah, there's, a couple, there's a couple in the chat, but yes, far yeah. away. Before deploying the sunshade, how does the telescope protect itself from the sun? Um, the, uh, to start with, it's stowed. And when they, when they I mean, you, you're also you're not cooling down at this point. Um, the, the, the sun isn't going to harm it, it as long as you're not trying to reflect the light into the instrument. But you are, what you've got to do is, is get the sunshade out so it can start cooling. That's the critical, critical thing. 
um, and it's going to take quite a while to get down. And, and the, the analysis to, to show that this thing is possible and during the development, some of the things that had to be done um, to ensure we could get cold, uh, there was you know, a number of changes and different things came along. The Because uh, you're right at the theoretical limit of what you can do. You never get down to 3K because you're going to be attached to the, the, the spacecraft bus. So there's always going to be some heat flowing through. Uh, and the sun shade isn't, you know, it doesn't stop absolutely everything. Um, so the thermal design is absolutely fundamental to this. Okay, John, Mario, you had a, yeah, a, um, a chat there. Yes, great talk. Thanks, John. Um, what I was going to say is how far from the Sun L2 line can the telescope actually observe, presuming if it gets its too great an angle, the sun comes around the edge of the sun shield? Yeah, that's a really good point, John. Um, yeah, you have to keep the, uh, all the telescope and the instrument shielded. So basically it will rotate, you, you can spin the whole observatory if you like, so you can scan a swath of sky, you, you can't um, uh, angle it out too much, but over a year of course, one yes. year, you'll scan the entire sky. But you've only got a very narrow path, presumably, because you can't move vertically out of the solar system plane very yeah, much. You can't, you can't suddenly just slew and go into the target No, so you can't actually look for any targets or opportunities. It's very no. much a no, no, no. you, long-term planned thing. Yeah, you, you've got to, um, you've really got to keep shielded. Uh, yeah. So there's a limited amount, but they, let's say they can take a complete swath and over, over the year you'll get the whole sky. Uh, yes. but yeah, that's why the observing has to be worked out very carefully. And of course, like all telescopes, what you don't want to do is to look at one object and then have to, say, rotate 180 degrees to look at something else because the time it's going to take you. So ideally, you try and plan things at so minimum movements, yes. maximum. Okay. Can it actually see the Hubble deep field, north and south? Because they're actually out of the plane, aren't they? Uh, oh, yeah. But I mean, if you think about it, the geometry is such that the... the the um, diameter of the L2 orbit, when you're looking at things far away, it's, it's kind of insignificant. You, mm. you can see. And one of the things that they will definitely be repeating the Hubble uh, things. I mean, when it started, the whole idea was to have it up before Hubble expired. Yes. And do if you like, simultaneous observations that would help calibrate instruments. Now, whether Hubble hang, you know, it's it just comes oh, from the um, we don't know. But, and for instance, Vega, I know Vega is one of the, um, the objects they want to look at early because you've, you've got the planetary um, uh, disk in there, the, the, the dust rings and so on. Um, but yeah, they're, they're absolutely overwhelmed with requests for observing time already. Thanks very much. Now, John, you may also made a point about the um, resolution of the telescope compared yeah. to Hubble. Well, it was about a subsidiary to the um, for the bit in the first video that says it's 100 times more powerful than Hubble. I wondered how they judge that. Uh, I, I put that down as NASA. Um, <laughs> uh, there's, there's all sorts of things you can do. I mean, the, the, you've got something like 25 times the light gathering area. Yes. That's about right. And then um, you could argue at the same wavelength, you're four times more sensitive. So there's four times 25 is 100. Oh, OK. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't place. No. That's fine. Okay. Thanks. Robin, Sue, you got your hand up there? You like Thanks, Dave. So. Thanks, John. Um, when deployment is taking place and it's opening things up and so on, presumably there's detectors that say, yes, this is now locked in place before it moves on to the next part. Is there anything that says, hmm, that should have locked in place and it hasn't, and then jiggles about a bit to try and fix it or anything? Yeah, well, deplo deployments are always terrifying things on, on spacecraft. And what you normally have a load of micro switches all over the place. Now, one of the problems with micro switches is they are notoriously um, unreliable. You know, I, I've been on a number of spacecraft projects where we've been faffing around trying to get the micro you, if you have it too sensitive you might not be reading the right thing if it's not sensitive enough you never know and, and they, you can get the wrong sort of readings but they are um 
that they are generally, this telemetry will come back and say, yes, we've got that signal or this signal. But a very standard thing on our spacecraft is you, you just- L orientate. Yeah, you, you fire a little rocket or you spin a wheel up. R-I-E-N-T-A-T-E. Not sure what that was, but no. I've got a quick question there. Um, if we're trying to look back a 13 billion years, I mean, we don't really know where the Big Bang occurred, do we? So how do we know where, where we're going to look? I hate that term, Big Bang. I mean, I think people probably know it's Fred Hoyle coined it as a term of abuse. Mm. The, the, you know, the people who wanted the, um, the non-steady state theory. And it's, it's not a... It, the Big Bang happened everywhere at the same time, as it were. Um, the, you, there's not a point where you say that's it. I hate the horizon programs that show a, a you know a dark room and a, a like an explosion in the middle, because you say, well, what's around the explosion? I mean, everything was inside the explosion, if you like. Yeah. So you don't you 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 wherever you look out in space, you will be able to look back almost. Uh, 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 as far as you can, um, yeah. not in one direction, as it were, for like a point. Do, do we know how the web will orientate itself once it's in position? How do you mean? Well, when you wanted to point somewhere, you want to take a reading. How does it orientate itself? Well, you use it's like most space have like star trackers, um, and uh, you you basically look at. Uh, certain star patterns, and that's how you know where you are. And the, the, I mean, the, the algorithms and the navigation are um, attitude and orbital control is a, you know, a, a pretty well established science these days. So you, you, it's just like any other spacecraft, it, it just takes references from what appear to be fixed stars. Mm -hmm. All right. So I guess it, it's, it's, I suppose it's fixed in the orbit, isn't it? If it's, if it's tracking the Earth around the sun then it's got to be pointed in some direction at some time. So eventually... You can, you can spin the whole observatory, um, so if you like, a, 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 around a line going out from the Earth. So the sun shield stays in, you know, keeps everything shielded, but you can then scan a complete orbit of the sky. Oh, what I see. Will, okay. Yeah, it's, it's like taking a swath, but over a year, you will, you will cover the whole sky. Mm, okay. Somebody called Arcanian. Uh, put a message in the chat. How does NASA deal with systems designed for JWST risk becoming near obsolete technology by today's standards, given they were designed decades ago? Do they have a mandatory requirement to be future proof for a minimum lifetime of X years in order to be signed off on what lessons can be learned for future decadal surveys, e.g. 2030 decadal survey? You, uh, I mean, it's a standard problem with any spacecraft. As soon as you design it, you're obsolete. But you, you have to design together to work. You have to build and test what we call qualification, which means you have to demonstrate that you'll survive all the environments you'll see. So that's the launch environment, which is massive vibration and acoustic input. You've got the thermal environment, you've got vacuum, radiation of, of space you've got to demonstrate especially with electronics that all those things you either shield it or it will survive and it takes time to do that and any spacecraft is is obsolete I say as soon as it's designed really um and something this big and complex has taken so long i mean nobody expected it to take that length of time and the project very nearly got cancelled um back in about 2010 11 uh, uh, and, and the guys at Goddard, that's where the project was run from, were convinced that they were too big to be cancelled. And, and they got the Nobel laureate at NASA. You know, and how could they be cancelled? And a lot of people were saying, look, guys, you, you're, you know, that they, they were out of control in terms of cost and, and schedule. And but there's all sorts of stories about that. We won't go into here. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a real worry. And the problem is... These things have been tested on the ground, mechanisms in particular, the things that tend to wear out. And we're all pretty worried about it. But 
But generally, if you survive the first few months, the, the, the so-called infant mortality um, issue, most spacecraft go on way beyond their design lives. Mm. Way beyond. Right. Richard also put something in the chat, said about resolution compared to Hubble, and what sort of tolerances does unfolded in the mirror need to achieve the target resolution? That was something I was thinking of as you was talking about the curvature of the mirror. Yeah. If you're um, looking at a different wavelength, how more critical or less critical does that curvature need to be? Yeah, I, I can't tell you that the tolerances, but I mean, the optical prescription is, is an enormous document. But um, most, well, a lot of the guys on, on James Webb had worked on Hubble, the optical engineers, and those guys are still haunted by you know, the Hubble cock-ups, basically. They were excoriated. I mean, they, they looked haunted. And we used to have incredible arguments with them about what might go wrong, or why this test result could be wrong, because all umpteen things cancelling each other, which you can understand. But the, the, the way they, they want to get around this was, I said very quickly, each mirror segment's got seven degrees of freedom. What that means is, each mirror segment can be moved in and out, up and down, side to side. You can rotate about each of those three axes. And in addition, the actuator's on the back. And because it's a very thin beryllium, effectively a front skin with a honeycomb pockets behind it, you can actually flex each of the segments very slightly to change the curvature. So you've got these seven degrees of freedom to let you line all eight segments up to make um, uh, a single smooth surface. And I, I remember at one of the NASA meetings, somebody explaining the algorithm for this, and it was, it was mind blowing. I think it's gonna take about six months to tune the mirror. And it's like all these things, as they get used to operating it, they'll find ways to tweak things even better. Fantastic. Anybody got any other questions? Yeah, I, I have one. Uh, and I go. Uh, I'm just wondering, was there any study done on whether micrometeorite impacts will affect the telescope? Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, micrometeorites affect all spacecraft. And you, you, you design for it. I mean, this is one of the things that, why spacecraft fail. Um, so, for instance, on solar arrays, we have what we call BOL and EOL, beginning of life and end of life. So you know the power will degrade because of micrometeorite hits. And there's some pretty well-established uh, factors you can use. So you size a solar array for the end of life case. So you've got more power at the beginning because you know you're gonna degrade. Things like the mirrors, uh, the mirror surface is gonna be damaged. Um, the electronics, radiation, you know, cosmic, um, radiation will go through stuff, uh, which is why you have redundant electronics in case you, you get a major failure. Um, and you, you will get damage. I mean, it's a fact of life. The sun shield will get little holes in it. And so long as they don't line up all the way through, hopefully you're okay. But, but say these things are part of the design equation and, and yeah, it's, it's going to happen. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, Colin just pointed out on their, um, uh, for BAP and for um, the Web Space Telescope project that's ongoing for outreach. We've got a workshop coming up in a few weeks' time, so uh, that'd be quite interesting to uh, meet some more of the engineers and the scientists and astronomers that are going to use that data. So it's going to be great. Yep. Uh, any other questions for John before we let him go? No. Okay. Right. Well, thank okay. you. Well, thank you very much, John. Absolutely right. brilliant. Let us know all about the Web Space Telescope. We'll look forward to um, Halloween. And uh, while everybody's out doing their uh, trick and treating, we'll be hopefully watching a rocket take off from Guyana. Yeah, fingers crossed. And seeing it well on its way. Finally. Yes. Yeah, that, that, uh, that'll be something. I mean, it, it is a sad fact of life that rockets go banned. You know, um, the astronomers get very, very twitchy, but if you worked in the business, you just have to live with it. That's the risk you have to take, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it, it is. Uh, but again, the, the, the deployments 
most of them, if anything goes wrong, there's not much you can do. You would lose the mission. So it is going to be incredibly tense. Uh, it really is. Um, I think there'll be a lot of sleepless people at the end of the 11th day. Okay, and you just said, is there a second James Webb Space Telescope? No, it's just the one, isn't it? No, no, no. There isn't a backup if it goes... Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, a lot of discussion about whether this is the last of the really big observatories because of the time and the money and all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. A lot of people think they'll never do anything like this again, um, especially with the way things have changed. And you, 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 know, you can fly satellite constellations to um, uh, replace you know, one single big... Um, uh, telescope, like on the X-ray missions, I think Julian was mentioning this before, that the idea is because you need, they've got such fine grazing angles to focus, you can actually fly as a separate spacecraft so one set of mirrors tens of kilometres yeah. away from the other one, you, know, you need incredibly precise control, but the sort of thing they're going to do with, with, with Lisa, it's the same sort of thing, the, the things have moved on, so maybe in the future there'll be distributed uh, observatories. Great. Oh, John's asked if we can get one of your T-shirts, please. Uh, that's an easy one. <laughs> I think we're going to work on the job to get one of those. <laughs> um, I'll volunteer. You, if you go on the ESA website, I don't know if they're selling them. You can get T-shirts off the ESA website. I don't know if they're doing a James Webb one. Yeah, yeah I've, I've got a Rosetta one that I wear when I do my Rosetta talk. So, uh, yeah, that goes down well. I decided now that spring is here and, you know, it's so warm, I'll put my T-shirt on. Yeah, well, apart from today, of course, yeah. yeah. Sunday was lovely, but today, yeah, it was snow, snow and hail. Excellent. Any, any other questions for John before we go? No? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah John, thank you very much for this speech. Um, the the launch date, is it locked in a, on a special date or... Um, if we miss the date, we can uh, replan it for a couple of days after. I mean, the L2 is following us, so I guess yeah. that's... Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't think there are too many constraints on the launch date. It's not as if you, um, you, you, you're you not that time critical. Okay. Um, I mean, it's more about um, not colliding with either junk up there is one of the considerations. <laughs> It, it, I'm not sure if it's linked to where the moon is. I don't think it's linked to where the moon is at that point. Um, they are, they are. I think they're 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 pretty well okay. There, there will be windows, but I think they're very broad. Um, but I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't take bets on it actually being on the 31st. I mean, Ariane have now um, manifested it as I think it's uh, the. 256 is it um it's on the list you know it's got it's got a, a, a flight number um but but you know dates come and go okay good well we look forward to that excellent All right thanks so much again john My pleasure. And, uh, thanks everybody for coming in again and making it the sex it it has been we've had over 60 people this evening so fantastic. Thanks very much for all coming in and making it the place it is yeah. this past year and a bit. Oh, Quakey. Thank Excellent. You, John. Thank you, Dave. No worries. No worries. Okay. Thank well, you. Again, thanks very much, John. Bye. Hello, thanks, John. everybody. Great and time. you know what I'm going to say? Keep safe, keep well, and when it is dark, keep looking up. <laughs> See you, folks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Stay safe, everyone.